पानी पानी रटते रटते प्यासा ही मर जाए पानी पानी रटते रटते प्यासा ही मर जाए आई कीप आई कीप रिपीटिंग वाटर वाटर एंड डाई डाई ऑफ दस्ट ऑफन टाइम्स वेन आई लुक एट द वर्ड सस्टेनेबिलिटी दट थ्रोन अराउंड एवरी लिटिल टाइम दैट्स अ फीलिंग आई ऑलवेज गेट यू नो बेरनाट शाह यूज टू से दिस famous quote you know that the problem with communication is is the illusion that it actually happened and i can very well say that if today he were to talk about sustainability he would say that the problem with sustainability we think it is already sustainable because we keep talking about it so many times so what does really sustainable and when we saying that designing for sustainability what do we mean so that because uh, you know i'm going to talk about you know i work in the areas of culture and agriculture and i realize that agriculture is the only domain where the culture piche piche aa jata hai i studied mechanical mechanical was not called mechanic culture right it's only agriculture that was called as agriculture and i was always fascinated by this topic and that's where i decided to move move away from uh, it and technology and get into agriculture so you know just to give you another example right uh, how many people are fans of lord ganesha great so have you wondered you know we are not going to talk about getting into religious pravachan mein nahi jana wale yahan pe but have you wondered why do we have humans before us have created the symbol of a human with an elephant head sitting on top of a mouse kabhi socha kya ki why have we designed this kind of way where a human has an elephant head but is sitting on top of a mouse any any guesses can we pass the mic if it's okay any guesses any thoughts why do we do that see at some level when we are looking at the whole problem of sustainability we need to think about a macro level which is where an elephant comes in and also a micro level which is where a rat comes in so whether you agree or whether you believe in faith or religion or not it doesn't matter at some level in, in our culture we always had this phenomenon of trying to connect the macro with the micro and that's where we are talking about this whole aspect of microbe to bio region right it's very sad that we couldn't be a part of the agri panel there out there where our farmers are talking a lot but i'm sure most of the conversations would have been about how to transition farmers from uh you know heavy dose chemicals synthetic chemicals to to more to a sustainable form of agriculture so there we are doing a lot of efforts but at the same time we are also looking at at some levels how do we build economies and local scale economies that are sustainable and that's where the bio region concept comes in so to discuss this topic i am going to have invite three of very dear friends with whom i have been chatting about and discussing about sustainability for a very long time I would like to welcome Samir Sishodia CEO of Rain Matter Foundation Dr Lakshmi Unnidan founder of the Diverse Local and Manohar Malani managing director NCS Green Earth Private Limited We are not going to spend time talking much about introductions because we feel Uh, you know what they share is going to be far more interesting than who they are and their background so you can look them up if you want to know based on what how interesting their 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 conversation is going about today we are in interesting times where if you talk to students they say that careers in agriculture is an unsustainable venture businesses are not really so serious about sustainable for sustainability for soil and government saying the only job that they have to do is keep the prices of the food down in such a kind of scenario what is it that we can do to to kind of look at design for sustainability and that is the 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 larger areas that we want to cover in right uh, i want to start off with samir in some in your website you almost talk about that like building for for bio regions or doing the right kind of invest investments is not charity but an investment for the future but i want to really want to be really honest with you and ask you that how do you convince your investors and then say that this is an investment for the future because we are not really used to to looking at this kind of investment at all right how do you do this um th- thanks i think this is a very important topic the macro to the micro so thanks for doing this 
i think sustainability has to be understood in the opposite of that word if something is unsustainable it stops to exist like somebody said earlier if our soils are unsustainable we are looking at a food security crisis if our water systems are unsustainable you know there's there's we're staring at hell if our air quality is unsustainable i already know friends who are getting out of delhi right but it's not just delhi it's uh, hyderabad's air quality was pretty poor bombay's is pretty poor all every all the places are getting there so essentially the bank is starting to go empty right and that's how you got to look at uh, like unsustainability is the word we have to really focus on sustainability has a very feel good factor to it ki ha ek cloth bag le liya bamboo product khareed diya ho gaya right but unsustainable means it will stop existing your current way of life your food systems your production systems your shareholder value everything will draw down to zero is it 10 years away 30 years away 100 years away is not for me to predict right that's a very tough one but i think we first have to understand that we are staring at drawing down to zero right and it's not very smart to do that <laughs> so if you have to continue living on this planet being able to eat decent food being able to have access to water being able to have generations which have decent health and so on and so forth we need to figure out how to do that well uh and i think you know when we are trying to figure out how to do that i think we also need to understand what is happening on the ground and i think uh you know your stories in in, in the diverse local and in various forums when you talk about what is happening on the ground right and i remember you telling uh some time back about the stories of how the tribals don't have the money to even maintain a sacred grove right uh maybe you know for for the people who are not really familiar with the idea and the concept of sacred groves can you tell us what happens when sacred groves are no longer sacred thank you uh, kakatiya sandbox uh, thank you desh pande foundation thank you venki ramachandran uh, for the invite uh, and for uh, helping me voice my thoughts out here uh, i am lakshmi uh, i am basically uh, an agriculture professional i have studied agriculture but i have turned myself into a storyteller because agriculture and uh, working with agriculture in many organizations have helped me realize the uh, the truth at the ground level i would say so many of my stories are uh, focused on uh, the local uh, communities um, when when we look at local communities we see that the local communities have got their challenges as well and they have the 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 solutions also lie in the community itself so it is very imperative or very essential that we analyze the solutions which we have with them and support them and manage the community so that we can have they can have a better life i was quite happy by the immersion trip uh, we which we did yesterday i was happy at how the rural uh, communities have been strengthened by the skill uh, uh, by giving the skill by giving uh, them the the communication holding i was hand holding i would say it was absolutely because whenever i see uh, whenever i work with indigenous communities and uh, whenever i work with local communities um, i see their struggle and the struggle is so real um, the struggle is in communication the struggle is in learning till 10th or 12th they they hardly manage somehow to pass and uh, there are community leaders around which help them do that making them help past 12th but after the 12th what is it so i recently for a story on sacred groves like um, i visited wayanad um, so that is when i realized that the dropout rates in uh, wayanad region uh, especially to the pvtg tribals primitive uh, tribal groups are more so when i asked interviewed one of them he said uh, ma'am i have taken commerce because i thought it would be easy because i don't want english in that but uh, when i went into the details and the depth of the subject is when i understood i cannot do it and he has left his education and there are many out there who has left their education and um, are struggling uh, with uh, narega jobs which are there uh, 100 days of uh, sure income and then they work in coffee plantations and uh, um, and, and and that's all uh, so i think skilled uh, 
work like how Deshpande Foundation is doing should be extended beyond to all these tribals also. And uh, coming to the uh, sacred groves, I actually went for a study to learn about the sacred groves. I wanted to see how their worship is now. So uh, you forget the worship, uh, they really don't have food to eat. Uh, the PDS rations which they eat um, are now lessened. They get around 3 to 5 kg, 3 kgs per person. And it is, it is very sad at that part that uh, in Vayana tribals, they actually, what they do is, um, they drink black tea in the morning. I actually had a, a made a list or a tabular column asking people what do they eat in the morning, afternoon and evening. So what they told me was, they drink black tea in the morning, they have black tea in the afternoon, in, at 4 o'clock they have black tea with some kind of a mixture in it and evening is when they eat rice. If they have some leftover rice in the night, that is what they eat in the morning. So the stark reality of situations down uh, is, is very, um, uh, is very uh, sad, I would say. And coming to sacred groves, uh, all of them had bigger, larger proportions of sacred groves when forests were there. Now they have been put out of the forest. They are, uh, the forests have become towns, I would say. The forests have got converted into towns. And um, whenever I ask them, they say, yes, sab jungle tha. Abhi koi jungle hai nahi. So uh, they were all forests uh, and uh, what they say is, ma'am, uh, there is no food available. So how do we light lamps in our sacred groves? How do we find uh, money for oil uh, to light the lamps in the sacred groves? So sacred groves have also shrunk. Um, they also need money to run. Uh, so worship has also gone Worship in the sense it is not worship. They actually worship uh, not like us. They worship trees. They have uh, they have created um, a, a grove with lot of trees in it, and they have got special trees. Uh, one of the trees were named Koli tree, uh, which is very important in their worship. Uh, they are all latex-based trees, is what I found out from my research. And they have got many other trees as well, which are very important for them. They have got their own significance of worshiping them. But uh, um, like uh, there are many people who have come into their land and captured that land so that the, the area of the sacred groves is shrunk and, uh, and uh, thereby there are a lot of uh, problems innate in all communities when we actually deep down go into them and look at them. Thank you. Thank you. You know, oftentimes what we do to humans is what we do to the plants. And what we do to the plants is what we do to humans. Right? Just like we have forgotten communities among humans, we have forgotten the same communities among plants as well. And, you know, whenever I go to field visits, I often realize that farmers are also beginning to have this technology mindset like I press one button, a problem should get solved. Right? I press, I, I put a more chemical, a more stronger dose of, let's say, a synthetic chemical, then, but then my pest gets solved. So in this kind of a scenario, you are promoting uh, and building also solutions that are looking at microbial communities, right? So what kind of, you know, if you want to look for, for a farmer to look at this kind of a transition, right, where the solutions immediately don't work because they're used to that kind of one-click kind of solutions. What is the kind of transition you see when they start to move in from, let's say, a, a synthetic pesticides to, to a microbial solution? Uh, well, First of all, I think sustainability professionals also have to look at sustainability with a different angle. So we are talking of one part of the sustainability where we are talking about the environment, ecosystem, everything. But then uh, the onus goes to the farmers or the field workers as a primary target who are supposed to work on sustainability and bring the sustainability. But the challenge is their day-to-day -day sustainability itself is a, uh, on a threshold. So if you tell them, okay, do this transition, and in a couple of years, there are bright uh, days coming ahead, your productivity will improve, soil will improve, all said and done, what they're going to do for these couple of years, they're already on the edge, right? And even they don't know after two years what will happen. Then to counter that, we fall into a different trap of trying to get them a premium on the produce, and market is a different beast. And 
we really, even those are proposing this, don't have too much control of the market on that premium. So now that's the cash 22 situation. So as a solution, we have to bring in alternates which will give a seamless transition. And maybe not achieving 100% in one go, but maybe getting to that 50-60% level, get the confidence of the farmers. Second thing is, if you look at the way, uh, I would write, define it like this way. There's 1% kind of farmers who are willing to put all the efforts, uh, kind of a missionary, they will take any kind of pain, anything, but they are passionate. Anyway, they don't need anybody else to go. They fight their own battle and they are there for themselves. There are 5% people. Those, if given a reasonable solution, they are willing to switch and do the experiment. Subjected to the survival is not at stake. Another 10% probably with a small incentive. If it works, they are willing to come on a bandwagon. The rest 35% are always monkey say, monkey do. Unless they see this happening and a lot of things happening, they will not ban vegan. So I would say, leave the 1%, you don't need them. Uh, they will make their daspani or they will put the effort, they are ready to work for 20 hours and be satisfied with even the small returns. Now, what this 5% and for them, what we can do? Right? Now here coming to the solution part. Unfortunately, uh, with the chemical approach or the microbial approach, the microbial and the alternate approach had been trying to mimic the chemical approach. That's the biggest trouble. Because now you are trying to play cricket with the rules of football or football with the rules of cricket. You can never uh, actually win the game. And I think we have fallen into that trap. Right? So now you see the articles coming of what is the role of P, K, N, uh, each individual element as if they are going to work wonders. Yeah, when you call them a biofertilizer. Yeah, and then <laughs> You termed something, mi microbial solution as biofertilizer, they are neither fertilizer, they are not fertilizer, they have got much more role to play, a different role to play altogether. So all that, then on the regulatory side also, for every microbe you take permission. It was very simple, if you have already identified at least these 50 microbes are safe, create a list of generally regarded as safe, and whatever consortia a manufacturer wants to give in a good formulation, let him experiment and give good solution. Because microbes don't work in isolation. They work as a team. So in a soil, you can't give one microbe and see magic happening. At the same time, if the same soil is enriched with multiple kind of a symbiotic microbes, they will work wonders. And do you expect a farmer to really go and buy 20 different products and put in? His budget will offshoot. The whole logistics and all mechanisms are poor. And worst thing, what government has done, or rather, I would not say government, the regulations have done, they've tried to define microbes only on the number of microbes in the bottle. So that is only one very small aspect of a microbial solution. So in the whole race, there is very difference, very little what a farmer can differentiate between the, between the products. That's another trouble. So now what's the solution uh, out of it? Solution has to be, microbes has to be combined together and delivered in uh, limited number of products so that farmers can use it. Instead of trying to teach farmers, another the very interesting aspect, everybody goes and tries to tell farmers, say, this is trichoderma, it takes him 10 days to first of all uh, learn the term trichoderma. Then you will say, this is, a, this is pseudomonas and all the complex names. And we expect farmers to learn all the products, all the names and figure out all, identify all problems and try to find out a solution for that. Can you look at human health like that? Mm. No, we are dealing with life science. It has to be a holistic approach. That if you have these balances, this is going to take care of your 90% of the problem. Rest is or 80% of the problem. And this has to be done without increasing the budget, without depleting the productivity and managing the profitability. Unless a solution like this is given to the farmers, you don't expect the ship to happen. Rest, otherwise, uh, I jokingly say, same set of 100 people get, get in every meeting, this is the same thing. Neither the canvas is expanding, nor the solution actually trickling down. No, that, that's not but it. the same thing is happening even in the bioregion space, right? Like, we are all used to idea of one wonder solution, right? One value chain solution that has scaled up and is promoted as a success story. 
how do you challenge that mindset see something as complex as sustainability or what we are looking at climate or biodiversity collapse or the eco economy or the farming transition or the rural livelihoods transition these are not these are not isolated you can't solve it like an equation it's not like you solve one part of the puzzle and you're done right if you have to address farming systems you have to understand that farming systems are part of your lived culture out there they were also your bitcoin engine for the village right the produce every year was fresh bitcoins if you will right it it actually kick started an economy it was not the economy every year uh, the village or a cluster of village could produce 50 different products that were related to the biodiversity that you had today you've lost all of that you're trying to look at markets elsewhere like i call it the elsewhere problem your solutions come from elsewhere your expertise comes from elsewhere if you have to get a job that's elsewhere the knowledge for that jobs comes from elsewhere the raw materials comes from elsewhere then you produce waste that goes elsewhere <laughs> right this this magical elsewhere doesn't exist the answer is in your place and it's all all of these components are and the there. success also goes to elsewhere the success goes elsewhere right the 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 answers lie in your by region you evolved with your region your agroecological region for millennia your food your culture your uh, farming systems your language your understanding of seasons everything is interconnected you cannot not understand not believe in your land not respect your land and expect to solve these problems i right? know these are these are very very deeply connected so as a, as a simple example even the first order the economics order is what people understand in the here and now all of these things are very abstract you most most of these clusters do not look at themselves as a market when we started doing a quick analysis it turns out that a sim, even a remote panchayat in jharkhand with just 200 households is spending over a crore buying vegetables there's your biodiversity there's your answer and if you by, by the way if you produce your vegetables for your farmers uh, for your own neighbors and your your own family then you will start doing better on how you produce it you understand soil microbes instinctively you understand soil biology instinctively you understand what chemicals do instinctively right if you start looking at the three crores that an average panchayat uh, constituents in kolar are spending on back uh, on poultry you start understanding the value of backyard poultry the losses are crazy people are buying 47 lakhs of toothbrushes in a panchayat in a year you know the list goes on and on and on a panchayat's economy is worth crores fmcg understands that but village india does not understand its own power its own value we saw one example of realizing your own value and your creativity earlier today right but that applies to everything a village does look at your consumption basket look at look at your land believe in it look at look at the plethora of skills you had build around that not technology and ideas i mean you need help from all of this but the foundational layer is an understanding of your land and that's what bioregionalism is really around no i think this is a good segue to to look at uh, dr lakshmi from from what you you shared with me about the kaipar rice right so one of the problems in in dealing with the elsewhere is is how do we bring community based decision making structures right we have lost that right if you look at the the panchayati uh, uh, studies also the the structures and the powers are also been dwindling so maybe you know to bring in some bit of optimism why don't you share how the community elders took initiatives to to revive the kaipad rice in kerala which you've been documenting very deeply uh, maybe that also could could be a example of how do we strengthen those community decision making structures kaipad uh, is a variety of rice which is grown in the coastal regions of kannur in kerala so the the speciality of the rice is that it is grown in a clay soil a clay soil which is very difficult to manage and it is got around uh, four or five months prior uh, culti cultivation process pre processing which is happening for the soil itself 
so uh, the the there is water up to the knee level or more than that uh, more water when the rice becomes ripe so what happens is that uh, water completely has been drained off and the uh, rock the, the clay soil becomes very hard so in that hard rock uh, you have to actually gather it into a mound and when the first rain happens is when you have to sow the seeds there and then the seeds grow there with the minimum amount of rain which is not happening now it is erratic rainfall so they find it very difficult to raise the seedlings there and uh, after that uh, when the rain happens is when they actually uh, go in boats in those regions and pluck the seedlings and then they uh, they actually throw it to distant parts because it is so difficult uh, walking or traveling on the uh, clay soil uh, so the the kaipad uh, rice has dwindled i would say there is not much of rice cultivation happening at all there so i met one uh, agricultural scientist um, there in kannur region she actually i i worked on a story with them so she actually when around 10 years back when she actually uh, started working on this rice is when uh, uh, we started communicating and uh, she actually with ppp partnership with partnership with the farmers she devise uh, she actually found out the problems with the current uh, uh, rice varieties there because once they uh, come big they will be very heavy the grains will be very heavy and they will lodge down back into the water and the uh, yield will be lost so that is when they all in partnership in farmers fields they worked out uh, uh, and they devised around they uh, found out around four or five varieties which are actually good they hold the rice doesn't bend down the panicle strength is good there are many tillers happening and this was actually uh, put uh, back into the farmers fields and now they get good yields but even then when they get good yields there are much more problems associated with it she tried creating a group for them called the malabar kaipad farmers society wherein they bring all the rice together and they help uh, sell the rice but the problem is not that it's not in selling the rice they have good demand everywhere you put it in amazon it is just sold off like quick cakes i would say but the problem is getting the farmers cultivated the problem is having labors availability there the problem is having people working there in this kind of situations uh, where they have to actually have a skill in working in these clay soils so community management has helped but then there are lot of other factors also which actually turn around in in uh, in accelerating the growth i would say so that is where i think we would need uh, more uh, help uh, more uh, devising new equipments i would say she is already on the pathway to uh, devise new equipments so help in that manner uh, and uh, this is the story about the kaipad regions thank you i think it's a these stories often don't get really documented in in terms of and i think uh, you know it's great that you are able to go down get down to the real reality of what is happening in uh, now Uh, manohar i wanted to also touch upon this aspect of when when samir was talking about the elsewhere problem right where we treat the problems as elsewhere so one of the things that really fascinates me in the products that you offer right among the various solutions is is also the aspect of self defense through a bio wall kind of a solution right today i don't see any player in the market who are trying to bring in bio, uh, microbes into the market talk about self defense also that there is ways where the plants can gain their self defense can you talk more about that and why is it that we don't see such kind of products are also emerging in which which don't necessarily say that you have to bring in some inputs from outside to for the for the plants right because that's another way of what the elsewhere problem is saying rather than bringing in some other inputs some other solutions to come in to to add to the nutrients we bring the soil robust enough to deal with it how is it that really working out well uh, there's one interesting aspect no till now we were talking of sites the primary problem happened because if you go to say amazon or any platform and if you look at the product categories you will see pesticide we'll see fertilizers we'll see plant grid regulator pgrs but if you look at where do you place this product if you give a product which is going to enhance the plant immunity and improve the soil it's, a, it's still soil conditioner you have got certain category but if you look at plant immunity booster or plant immunity enhancer there is no such category to communicate also to the farmers and if you log into krishi darshan in the morning you know what you uh, hear 
So that is one thing that is lost. But why it is more relevant even today? Uh, even it is more relevant today is, see, for pest and disease still you can say, okay, I've got a pesticide. But with the kind of climate change we are seeing, with the, the kind of extreme weather events we are seeing, you need to have a plant being more resilient. You don't have a choice. Right? Now, plant resilience and plant immunity are integrated. If the plant is strong and robust and soil is good, then only it can be resilient, otherwise not. Right? So, so we are seeing so many cases now, whenever there are extreme weather conditions, then a plant given with proper doses of maybe products like uh, silica and maybe certain microbial combinations, if they are treated with that and given with the proper nutrition, they are able to sustain these extreme weather conditions in a much better manner, thereby giving a lot of control to the farmers, if that happens. What is not happening? Um, is a very difficult question to answer. Though efforts are going on at multiple levels, but the concept being new, everybody is a bit lost. People are lost at whether it will work or not, hmm. how it will work. Second thing is, it has to be given as a combination. So single product cannot enhance the immunity. Now, till now, if you look at the agriculture space, and if you look at, look at even the way the agriculture universities conduct the trials, it is all single product based. You take one product, they will test it out. But this strategy will work with multiple or combination of products, maybe two, three, four, five, six. Like, we have created something with a six product kit, mm. which uh, brings in that solution. But it has to be given in synergy, which work together and bring in the magic, mm. not as a product in isolation. That is another challenge that people are facing, mm. or rather the, uh, from the market dynamics perspective. So how to position it, how to get it tested, are the, the roadblocks and probably one of the challenges I can see mm. in pushing it. No, at one level, you know, if I really push that thought to you, right, uh, the fact that there are no categories for a product that brings self-resilience self is not surprising, right? Because for, for almost for decades, we've, we've been uh, conditioned with the idea that rural India exists to serve the urban India. And one of the reasons where we look at the whole uh, topic of bioregion is, is to actually to break that distinction that, you know, there is, there is something called as a rural India, which is, which is giving away its resources for the benefit of a very small six city, you know, like Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta and, and the, that six city, right? So from that kind of uh, an exploitative relationship of urban India taking its benefits and giving away some small pittance, Right? What has been your experience when this has shifted? When the, when, the, when the villagers are saying, I don't want you to come and take my resources and give me a pittance. Right? What has been that kind of shift and what have been your stories in which you have seen that shift happen among rural India? So, uh, taking on from his example, I mean, I don't think there's a one-size-fits solution to anything. What works in Kerala and what works in... Uh, Kodugu and the Hima and Himachal and the Northeast and, and Odisha and Telangana will all be different because all of these regions were different, their crops were different, their, their livelihoods were different, they evolved different strategies, they evolved different mechanisms. I'm sure the plants did it too and so did human societies. That's why, it's, that's why we call these cultures, right? Just, just like curd is not set using the same culture across the country. Right? This, these solutions are not going to be set using the same mechanisms, top-down imaginations of what the solutions are. They have to be evolved bottom-up. And when people start to understand their place, they start to understand, hey, you know what, my nutrition problem has this gap and let, where, where people have started nutrition gardens in uh, the experiment in the, you know, Dr. Eji and his team have done, uh, they've actually managed to keep health problems at bay for a 500 strong community very easily. People have created livelihoods out of uh, better soil and water. Akshay Kalp, I think the solutions have come in so many ways in so many places. There are good examples. It's not yet the mainstream. So that's the gap right now. Yeah, and it's not yet mainstream is also probably, you know, I mean, it's one reason why this panel is very interesting, right? Because all of you have certain ways of uh, shifted your careers also in some sense when this shift also has happened. So I'm just curious to, to kind of switch gears to a slightly a personal side, right? When you start to look at these things, uh, these aspects of communities and all of them, I'm curious to understand how have they sort of influenced your own life? 
like this understanding in what ways has it uh, influenced your life this aspect of looking at these relationship between a micro and macro and also building these communities in what ways they have resulted in some changes in your own life that you can see maybe from you yeah very interesting question <laughs> because it uh, says a lot of my life which i have uh, actually come through um, uh, I did my agriculture, um, I passed my doctorate and um, I went back, I, I was in Kerala and South India at that point of time and moving to Delhi was a very different scenario for me. Uh, the, the spaces in Kerala are very different from the spaces in Delhi. So I could experience a different kind of uh, living there where you live in 100 square feet houses where you really don't have windows at the back and we, we have only windows at the back and front where uh, in Kerala, my every room had three or four set of windows where every morning I open the windows, it's a new possibility for me. So it's all green and I'm going back to, uh, uh, to Delhi where, uh, so it is actually that shift has actually influenced me a lot to see regions, I would say, it's very uh, perspective of the talk which we are having. The, the bio regions have changed for me from Kerala to uh, Delhi and um, I took a small career break wherein that has actually influenced my thoughts uh, and um, at a very micro level if you would uh, analyze my life I would say uh, that break has actually helped me uh, focus on my priorities that I have lost, I would say focus on my hobbies that I have lost. Uh, to create a kind of uh, stress management techniques where um, the, the too much of studies and too much of work was giving a kind of stress where I, I just needed, I knew I just needed to slow down a little bit and uh, manage my stress and uh, indulge in some kind of activities more than what uh, academics give you like photography. I'm a photographer too, so I indulge in photography. I indulge in gardening on the little spaces in Delhi. I would make it a forest. So uh, that has actually influenced me at my micro level. So at, at the macro level, when I uh, analyzed, uh, am I doing the right thing in this? Uh, or is it this what I'm going to do with my studies, what I have done? So I thought I should extend my hand more into the community. And that is when um, the farmers market started happening in Delhi. And many of my friends ha were farmers. And uh, they wanted help in extending an arm out and uh, spreading the word about it and helping them set farmers markets. So I think in 2011 when farmers markets came in Delhi, I was all around helping people uh, there to help them and uh, see them and even spread word about them and ask people to actually go find clean food and start uh, using them for their better health. So that is the, uh, the, the micro level community management I would say. And, uh, and that has actually influenced me that period with the farmers and, uh, and that period uh, of uh, not working has actually influenced me to look at transformations and uh, that is when uh, opportunities came and I started working in sustainability transformations then from there to being an editor, from there to being a storyteller and there to being the founder of the Diverse Local wherein I focus on uh, human uh, ecology, I focus on food, I focus on culture and uh, I think we have got an innate connection with all these things along with development, along with education, along with skilling. Uh, we need this kind of a, 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 a bond which we actually can't describe but it is there. Yeah. So, thank you. Manohar, from you, you were earlier selling uh, antivirus yeah. software yeah. and then how did you come into microbes? <laughs> I, think I mean, actually, it's very very interesting, you know, antivirus to microbes. Yeah, I, from the computer viruses to uh, the plant viruses and bacteria and all those aspects. It is very humbling, in fact. Uh, while doing IT security, I, we used to think, or at least I used to think, that I'm very intelligent. Uh, I know so much about IT security, cyber security, and all the seminars, all well-heeled guys and meeting everybody. Uh, but the moment I started understanding the complexities of farming and the world around it, then it was like that was a class two problem which I was solving and this is all of a sudden I am into a graduate at a postgraduate class and I don't know how to handle it. And more, I, more we had been reading, more we had been going deeper into it, even we don't know how many variables we are dealing with. Yeah. There at least problem solving is limited because reasonably these are the variables. You sort out and the problem gets sorted out, it's a matter of time. 
maybe two days or seven days, ten days. You don't take more than that time to crack a problem. But here, you can probably end up spending your whole life and is still solving only a few, few parts of the problem and to understand. So that made me humbler and that made me respect the farmers and the community much more. As you rightly said, we had taken rural India or the farmers for granted, assuming, and we have, in fact, we have degraded because if you look at Bachpan mein kya bula ya tha, kind of a thing, padega nahi to kya kheti karega. So like, that was as if, if best, best, best that's the lower end thing. It's the other way down. Well, if you don't do this, you will have to do farming, which is so much intelligent. You will have to put so much effort over there to yeah. be prepared, yeah. kind of a thing. So the kind of respect farming should have been given has not been given up. Samir, you were, you were wrote a lot of code in your past life. Uh, if this current Samir were to talk to that old Samir who wrote a lot of code, what would you first thing would say? No, that, that, that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm actually, I, I bought a farm. I'm trying to trust more and more the land and my ability to work with the land uh, more than I trust my stock market investments. So hopefully I can find my answers more there than there. Beautiful. Thank you.